Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One Namo Sadanto Sucedo Ye Olavadi Samyaho Sambuto Shi Namo Sadanto Sucedo Ye Olavadi Samyaho Sambuto Shi Wu Shang Sheng Sheng Wei Miao Fa Bai Qian Wan Xie Nan Sao Yu Wu Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi Yuan Xie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Shifu Shangren, Gowei, Shishong, Dajia, Ami Tofo, Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture today. My name is Hong Shu. Uh, today is Sunday, December 10th. Hmm. Can you imagine that? Two weeks till Christmas? Seems hard to believe. And it is the 9th of December in California. Welcome to our Sutra Lecture. Today, we're going to continue to look into the Avatamsaka Sutra's story of Sudhanas becoming a Buddha in a single lifetime. And uh, it's a great story, and there's many episodes, and we are, uh, we've reached that crossroads. We've now, uh, crested the mountain, we're down into the valley of the pilgrimage. So, quite exciting moment in the, the history of this text. Uh, we've been waiting for this for some time. And the uh, most interesting part is that we have the encounter between two of Buddhism's most famous exemplars of great wisdom. One is Shariputra, who is the, the disciple, great disciple, revered by the Theravada tradition uh, as the disciple with the most wisdom. And then he comes face to face with Manjushri Bodhisattva, who in the northern tradition, in the Mahayana, is the Bodhisattva of great wisdom. And the two of them uh, face off. And so, uh, we get our chance these next, uh, going to be probably four, this next month, we get to uh, bounce off of the teachings of Shariputra and, and understand how, they, how the sutra wants us to recognize him and the, the teachings that he delivers. And then uh, Manjushri comes on with great strength and we find out about his uh, profound uh, insights, not only, now this is, I'm ahead of myself here, we haven't finished our protocols, but uh, it's important to, uh, as we introduce him, I have been, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll wait on that, we'll, we'll continue uh, after we acknowledge country, after we invoke the spiritual presence, after we sing the bell song and get everybody welcomed. Then I'm going to share a little bit about uh, what Manjushri means in the Avatamsaka. Because we just, uh, he has just shown up a few weeks ago now. And uh, his, he will be a continuing presence throughout the beginning, middle, and end of Sudhana's pilgrimage to Buddhahood. So, let's do that.
want to acknowledge respectfully the Kumbumere people of the Ugambi language region as traditional storytellers and custodians of the land where our monastery is located. We pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging, and to all First Nations people whose sovereignty was never ceded. So, having done that, here we go. Uh, I was, by the way, I wanted to say that uh, I was watching a interview with people. Um, it, the interview took place at, I believe it was MIT. Um, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and it was a discussion about AI, and uh, the host, before he began, acknowledged country, and he really did it, Australian style, but this is completely Massachusetts, and uh, it was very gratifying to see this custom catch on in, in the United States, so, yeah. All right. We have the bell song to go. Let's do that. Bell sound by breeze out throughout a hundred million worlds. A Buddha's law is heard and spread. All throughout the triple world, the wondrous sounds that everywhere fill the Dharma realm with peace. May those who hear it gain the strength to follow in faith the Buddha's path. 众生传三切界内，佛法养万亿国中，共训启发界和平，利益报探若后的。We will put that slideshow away and continue with where I left off, which is to say, today uh, there is a sutra. We're in, uh, for, for those who are not all that familiar with what's going on here, we're in the Flower Garland Sutra, the Huayan Jing, called the Avatamsaka. And the first 38 chapters of the sutra talk about the Bodhisattva path, how to be a Bodhisattva, how to be one of the best humans ever to walk the planet. It's a do-it-yourself. It's an instruction manual for how to do that. But it's theory. It's a bodhisattva should do this. Or if you want to be a bodhisattva, here's what you do. Chapters 1 through 38. When we get to chapter 39, which is mostly the last chapter, suddenly we get a pilgrim, a hero, who shows up and takes the first... 38 chapters full of instructions and puts them into practice. He does, he walks the walk. He takes theory and puts it into practice. He takes principle and puts it into specifics. He takes the uh, shoulds and turns them into does. So, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, his name is Sudhana Shadzai Tongzi. And he is a figure that um, Chinese Buddhism has I, put into iconography. They made, a, they made a model of him, they painted him, and he always appeared as a little kid, like a child, a baby, with five braids on his head, and wearing, you know, diapers. 
And that's a mistake, actually. Uh, that's not reality. Because reality appears in our sutra. They somehow, the artists in Buddhism got the tongzi part, shantai tongzi. And tongzi in Chinese translates as um, a virgin boy, somebody, a young man who has not yet passed puberty, um, sort of. But it also gets interpreted interestingly, um, similarly to the Blessed Virgin, Roman Catholicism. When you see the Holy Blessed Virgin, she's got a baby Jesus in her hands. Well, Shantai Tongzi got put into that mold with Guan Yin Bodhisattva. So Guan Yin appears holding this infant. And also, but she gets two, she gets Dragon Girl. So we have Shantai and Long Nu, Dragon Girl, uh, under Guan Yin's feet, sometimes as Guan Yin gets portrayed in images. So that is, I guess, one depiction, one story surrounding our hero. But in our sutra, that is not him. He is a strapping, strong, young, uh, vital, uh, able-bodied pilgrim who gets sent on a decades-long search for wisdom to 53 different teachers. And that's not what a baby does. That's what a young man does. So my favorite story about this is uh, I visited Wu Taishan out in Shanxi province, 1989. And I was excited because we had been going to four holy Buddhist mountains in China and Wutai Five Peaks Mountain is one of those. And I knew I had been studying the Avatamsaka and uh, while all four mountains, although nine flowers, Chihuahua Shan is not specifically mentioned in the Avatamsaka, but Puto Shan is and Ume Shan is, that's Samantabhadra's mountain. But Five Peaks, Wu Tai Shan, that's Manjushri, Bodhisattva's mountain. And so I really had it in my mind that I wanted to see uh, what Wu Tai, what Five Peaks Mountain was about. And uh, so we visited and mentioned to the abbot who greeted us that we were uh, Master Shrinhua's disciples and were very interested in the Avatamsaka Sutra. So he said, oh, all right. And he says, Come with me. And this is in Huayan Su in Avatams in, on Five Peaks Mountain. So he says, come with me. So we go around back behind the Buddha Hall into the next courtyard to the back, 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 back. Buddhist monasteries are built in this four square. And there's the Four Kings Hall, there's the, the Great Hall, there's the uh, Guanyin Hall, there's the Lecture Hall, and then in the back, and there's the abbot's quarters, but then there's also the Tripitaka room and the drum and bell. There's the library and then the drum and bell tower. So he took us to the back, which is the library, and we went around the corner, and he said, here's Shansai Tongzi. And here was a statue of good wealth who looked just like all the bodhisattvas. He could look a lot like our bodhisattva on the altar here, Manjushri. He, looked, he had that same kind of strength and vigor and vision. And he said, this is good wealth. Don't be mistaken. Don't be fooled by the, the other image of him. So he's our hero. And we're not going to meet him yet. He has not appeared yet in the sutra. Who we get today is Shariputra. Anybody who's recited the Heart Sutra has met Shariputra, but if anything, he is more important to the Theravada tradition than he is to the Mahayana tradition. He is the exemplar of great wisdom, and he is largely responsible for the Abhidharma, uh, the codification of Buddhism's psychology. Understanding of the mind is in the Abhidharma. So Manjushri, is, or uh, Shariputra, is, is that guy. So, with that in mind, let us dig in and see what we can learn from our sutra. Let's see here. Okay, here we are. Make that 
bigger, please. Thank you. Okay. Right there. Okay, for all of you who read Chinese happily here, I'll give you a line and you give it back to me. All right? Here we go. Start right here. Ar shi zun zhe she li fu cheng fo shen li jian wen shu shi li pu sa Okay. Yu zhu pu sa zhong hui zhuang yan Chu shi duo lin Wang, let's see, too big, too big. Here we go. Wang Yu Nan Fang Yo Xing Ren Jian Zuo Wu Shi Nian. I'm not sharing at the moment. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. Ah, thank you, Jerry. I got it. He has to do that every time. Ready? Wu Jin Dang Yu Wen Shu Shi Li. Chu Wang Nan Fang. There you go. Okay. Now, let's see if we can't read this together and obey the punctuation. The punctuation is our friend. It is there to help us breathe so that we can recite together very beautifully. Yi Kou Tong Yin, different mouths but a single unison sound, uh, tells us to pause. When you see the comma, uh, the uh, what else? Do we have any semicolons? No. And then we stop at the period. Okay, are we ready? Let's go. Here we go. At that moment, Venerable Shariputra, aided by the Buddha's spiritual power, comma, pause, saw that Bodhisattva Manjushri, together with the assembly of Bodhisattvas attending him, had come out of the Jada Grove and was traveling south to the world of people. And he thought, it is time to go south with Manjushri. Okay, let's unpack this. Now, I wanna say, um, if people remember, it was whew, a year plus ago, when we embarked on the investigation of this chapter, chapter 39, called Entering the Dharma Realm. It was a year or more ago. and we said we want to get to Sudhana's section quickly and there are two scrolls of prelude, two scrolls of preparation before we get to Sudhana's appearance. And so what we decided to do was kind of go quickly. We were going to kind of skim. There was lots of repetition, lots of preparation, lots of praises by bodhisattvas in front of the Buddha, etc., etc. And so we did, and we went, bup, 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 bup. we recited a lot of it. Well, that time is over. We're going to go more slowly now. We're going to savor, going to investigate, we're going to learn what we can and uh, recite together, but not, we're, we're not trying to get anywhere else. We're right where we belong. So that's from now on, we'll be slowing down a bit. Okay, at that moment, just then, Venerable Shariputra had received the Buddha's mm, light and with that he saw that Manjushri, the greatly wise Bodhisattva, um, together with a crowd of Bodhisattvas who were traveling with him, we'll find out more about them uh, in a bit, came out of the Jada Grove. They left the Buddha behind and came down south to where people and devas and gods and dragons were waiting. Manjushri had a thought. And like our sutra, people say this is philosophy. Well, it's more than philosophy. We get to look into the mind of, Man of Shariputra, who says, oh, there goes Manjushri, I'm going with him. I'm going down to listen to what he can teach. All right, so interesting, right? Um, just before, what had happened was Manjushri did what everybody does when you see the Buddha, which is you bow and make an offering. That's, the sutra portrays that so 
consistently, Manju, uh, Manjushri Bodhisattva is a big deal. He is a major teacher in Buddhism. Everyone bows to Manjushri. Manjushri bows to the Buddha. So there's a lot of respect in being paid in the Buddhist community. And does the Buddha want Manjushri to bow his head to him? No, it's not that. Manjushri, from his heart, wants to pay respects to someone who has put an end to birth and death and has deep compassion for every living being. So that's an important point, that Manjushri, when he sees the Buddha, behaves just like a brand new refuge disciple. He bows and makes an offering to the Buddha. Now, comes out of the Jada Grove, leaves behind the big assembly with all those bodhisattvas from Ten Direction, and he's got a job. This is, he is the uh, catalyst, he's the spark plug for the action to happen in the sutra, which is he has uh, someone to teach, and that someone is Shantai Tongzi, Sudhana. Okay, now, who is Shariputra? Let's find out. Shariputra is a big deal. Let's see here. Uh, we'll pick a good one. How about this one? Here's Shariputra. This is the way the Burmese see him. Shoot, if I could move that. Oh, no. So here he is in Burmese robes um, with his feet in the student's position. He's listening to the Buddha. Okay. So portrayed as a young man, right? There he is. Got that one. Here is Mons. Shariputra, he's got a tin staff, he's dressed like a monk. In fact, many of the images um, of Shariputra show him at the Buddha's right hand. He is in images from the southern tradition, from Thailand, from Burma, from Sri Lanka, from Laos, Cambodia, and other places. Shariputra is standing to the right of the Buddha. He is the Buddha's wingman, and he is responsible for delivering a lot of the teachings that the Buddha wants to teach, often in terms of uh, debate. So Shariputra has so much wisdom and information that whenever there is a challenge, whenever somebody has to be uh, out-debated, call on Shariputra. He will, he's the one. Now, this is from Dunhua. This is a cave painting. You can see all the arhats around him, and lions and devas who come to make offerings, and he's got a canopy over his head. Devas are flying through space. He's very adorned. He's got a halo. Uh, Shariputra was truly wise. And he is the teacher of many of the Buddha's disciples, including, we're going to find out, 6,000 bhikshus here in, in the Avatamsaka Sutra. Here he is. Okay, uh, let's see. So, question. Uh, in previous sections, bodhisattvas from all directions gather at the Jada Grove. They teach beings without leaving. How come Manjushri Bodhisattva had to get up and leave for the South? <laughs> Are you a lawyer? Is that? Is that uh, I know. People, inquiring minds want to know. I understand. Okay, you could say these bodhisattvas who don't leave the Jada Grove, they um, each have living beings whom they have, you could say, contracted to teach. They have living beings with whom they are connected, who they can teach. And the sutra uh, gave us, I guess it was two or three weeks ago, 
The sutra gave us all of the different places where bodhisattvas go. Some go to villages of asuras. Some go to cities of devas in the heavens. Some go to teach in the other realms, right? And they can do that from where they're sitting. That's the way they can teach those living beings. In this case, Manjushri has to go to a place called City of Blessings, Fu Cheng, and that's where he's going to meet all these young people. And at the head of the young people, there's what, what do they say, 300 young people who come out of the City of Blessings is one in particular, their leader. And his name is Shan Sai Tong Sudan. So Manjushri's got a contract to, to initiate Sudhana into his pilgrimage. And if he didn't do that, we wouldn't have a story. So that's the reason. Fa Wu Ding Fa, there are no fixed dharmas. Everybody has, in the sutra, has a certain number of beings who they can teach, and they have to appear in a certain body, speak a certain language, explain things in a certain way, and when all those conditions are right, those living beings, fa putishin, make the Bodhi resolve and, and cultivate the way. So, uh, that's why. That's why Manjushri has to go there. That's the, the, he's got people waiting for him to hear that, to hear the story, the way he can teach it. Okay, now, um, I'm gonna, I'll let you look at the, uh, this image and talk a little bit about Shariputra. Um, Shariputra was born into a Brahmin family. His name in Chinese is Shanzi or Shurizi. The Shari was his mother's name. Putra is son of or child of. He's the child of Shari. He's also known as the, the body child of the body. Um, he, his, his mother was a great teacher of him, of a child. She raised a good kid, a good son. The story goes, these legends say that at age eight, this young boy, who, he was not Shariputra at this point. His name was, uh, um, have to look it up. He, this, Shariputra was his dharma, his Buddha's name. But he was able to out-debate learned teachers in his neighborhood. He was eloquent, he, was, he could quote, he had a great memory, and of course an eight-year-old stepping forward to put down the uncles and the, the elders, people predicted a great future in wisdom for this young man. Uh, his father was a renowned debater as well. He was born on the very same day as a young man who, to whom he was related, uh, became best friends, and together with Shariputra, this young man who later on became who? Madhgayaya, the foremost in psychic powers. The two of them set out on a spiritual quest. They went through all the local teachers. There were all these famous teachers in the neighborhood, like India then, like India now, is a huge hotbed of spiritual uh, schools, spiritual learning. So they found teachers, but they were unsatisfied very quickly. At age 20, they found teachers whom they uh, enlisted under, enrolled in their school, and then left them because their teachings were not ultimate. These two young men were already uh, able to think past the principles taught by these teachers. And then at one point, there was a bhikshu who was walking through India. His name was Asaji or Asvajit. Asaji in Pali, Asvajit in Sanskrit. And this disciple asked them, who they followed, what they knew, and they told him. And they asked him, they said, Venerable Asaji, what, how does your teacher teach? Oh, says Asaji. He says, my teacher teaches like this. 
，诸法从缘生，诸法从缘灭。我佛大沙门，常为如是说。He said, "All dharmas, all things whatsoever, come together because of conditions. Furthermore, all things whatsoever fall apart when those conditions cease." My teacher, the great shaman, always teaches us like this. When the future Shariputra heard this teaching, he immediately realized arhatship. He, they say, certified to stream entry. He became a stream enter at that point. He understood what the teaching of emptiness. What is that? What's that verse? What's the big deal about that verse? What's its power? It's if all things come together because of conditions, 诸法从缘生 What that means is there is no supreme being in the middle. So by saying that, by teaching that way, saying that all things whatsoever, from the human body to the planet around us, and everything in it, are there temporarily because of cause and effect. What has been removed is the central figure of a creator, like a Brahma, or Vishnu, any of the Hindu divinities that were the foundation of theistic religions. In Christianity, in Judaism, and Islam, of course, it's God on high, the Father, the supreme being. So the Buddha understood that there was no fundamental supreme being. At the heart of things, and by teaching that way, Shariputra saw the layers peeling away, peeling away. It's like an onion; you peel it layer after layer, and you get to the center, and there's nothing there. There is only doing, and the Buddha nature. And he woke up. That was it. And then, now, interestingly, there's another legend that says he didn't understand it right away. He had an awakening. But he didn't realize our hot ship until two weeks later. He had to think it over.、Uh, whereas Magalayana heard that and woke up on the spot. So various stories. But pretty quickly, Shariputra and Magalayana, the two of them, both woke up to this teaching and followed the Bhikshu Aspajit to the Buddha. Yeah,、oh, we want to meet your teacher. Now, the interesting thing was that. Shariputra, the future Shariputra, at this point had 500 disciples who were following him, because they saw that he had already broken through the teachings of his non-ultimate teachers, and they were following him. And so, overnight, the Buddha's assembly grew by 500, because they followed Shariputra to the Buddha and became his disciples all at once. So that's how it went in India at the time. So now the Buddha's assembly is much expanded, and he's got these outstanding new disciples, whom he says, "Okay, you can take charge of the rest of the students." So the Buddha made Shariputra the teacher of his large following. At one point, 1,250 disciples of the Buddha were constantly with the Buddha. So,、um, time passed, and Shariputra, lots of stories about him. One of the famous stories is that、uh, Buddhism was successful in the south, but up in the north of India. It was harder to teach. There, the teachers up there were very stubborn in their ways, and、uh, Buddhism was not as successful in the northern provinces. So, a donor、uh, whose name was Sudatta, who is known as the Qi Shi Qi Gu Du Yuan, you know, he was the the one who donated the Jade Grove. He asked for help from the Buddha to send a disciple who could 
out-debate the teachers in the north because he wanted to build a monastery in the north for the Buddha, but he, he was afraid that if he went up there by himself, he was going to, maybe his faith in the Buddha's teachings would not stand. He might waver and not be able to out-debate the teachers who challenged him and who tried to get them to their side. India was a place of debate and contention among schools, so many teachers. So the Buddha said, all right, no worries. I will send Shariputra with you. Now his name was Shariputra. And he went with Sudatta up to the north. And so the teachers saw him and said, oh, why are you following that uh, inferior shaman, the Buddha? And Gautama, whatever they called it. So Shariputra said, fine, fine, come on, we'll, we'll debate. So the teachers in the north stacked the deck. There were, they sent a dozen teachers to out debate him. And Shariputra said, welcome, welcome. I, this is a great opportunity, nice to meet you all. He might have said Ami Tofo, but I don't know if he did. So gr the great debate was held. Shariputra danced through them, made mincemeat of their theories. And in the afternoon, everybody became a disciple of Shariputra and the Buddha through Shariputra. Oh, Sudatta, the, the donor, was so delighted that he uh, opened up his treasuries. Shariputra designed the Jada Grove with huge number 16 great halls and 60 dwellings, places, dormitories, and prepared for the Buddha. So when the Buddha came, uh, indeed, it was a grand uh, everybody was all excited to greet the Buddha, and it was Shariputra who had made the, laid the groundwork for so many disciples to discover the Dharma. Now, um, I went to, uh, I searched through uh, various Mahayana teaching sites to get their story on Shariputra, and it's interesting because the, the story that we heard Master Hua when he introduced Shariputra was the same story that I found on numerous uh, Mahayana teaching sites. And the, it, the story depicts Shariputra retreating from the Bodhi resolve. And uh, I won't I won't go into it in, in detail, but it involves somebody asking Shariputra for help in curing his mother. And Shariputra says, of course, I, I am learning the Bodhisattva path, because he is representing the Arhats, right, the great disciples. So now he's ready for the Bodhisattva path. And he says, how can I help your mother? The person says, my mother, need, her illness needs an eye an eye to be cured. That's, that's what she needs, a human eye. And so Manjushri says, <laughs> kids, don't try this at home. Manjushri plucks his eye out, hands it to the guy, says, cure your mother with this. And the guy looks at it and says, Puh, throws it to the ground, stomps on it, and says, that's useless. My mother needs a left eye. You gave me a right eye. So Shariputra has to decide whether or not to pluck out his left eye. And so the story hinges upon him saying, oh, the Bodhisattva path is just too hard. I can't pluck out both my eyes. The website from Ningyan Si that I found, Stories of Shariputra, has him plucking out his second eye and handing it to the guy and saying, please save your mother, thereby uh, not retreating from the Bodhisattva path. So there is, when you hear stories about the disciples, it's good to recognize that we, we're looking back through 2,500 years of uh, harmony and conflict alike. And schools did compete to uh, show superiority or inferiority, etc. So Shariputra, in many of the stories, 
is shown to be not yet a bodhisattva, but often if you continue through to the bottom of the story, you discover that they say Shariputra is in fact a bodhisattva in the robe, in the body of an arhat who has come back to teach the other arhats. Okay? So, he is a undercover bodhisattva. So, <laughs> that's a, a way to gather him back in. All right. In any case, he is truly a remarkable figure. And as I was thinking about this, there's, you have to do this kind of little bit of a dance here through historical time, which is what? These are historical figures. These are men and women who actually did live in India 2,500 years ago. And we are seeing them through the filter of text, through the filter of history, through the filter of debate among schools. And who else can you come up with in human history whose lives we are still exploring two and a half millennia later? These are uh, exemplars of a world of wisdom that still opens up to us today. So there are other uh, encounters with, let's see here, Tianzhu, where is Shariputra here? This is from the Lotus Sutra. These are devas. Shariputra is, he appears, I guess this is he down here. He appears in the Lotus Sutra. Um, he appears in the Vimalakirti Nirdesha, Weimo Jijing. Um, he appears, there's one more story that I'd like to tell about Shariputra, which is he was such a devoted disciple of the Buddha that when the Buddha announced that in one month he was going to enter Nirvana and leave the world, Shariputra went home to the room in which he was born and entered Nirvana. He died and entered nirvana, that is to say, before the Buddha did, by two days, they say. His thinking was, that what's the point of staying in the world when the Buddha's not here? So there are incredible um, images of, in, in the Thai tradition in particular, of the Buddha entering, of, of here we are, of Shariputra entering Nirvana um, back home in advance of the Buddha. So, the uh, many, many stories of the um, various teachings of the Buddha, probably this is the one that's most useful for us today, which is the verse. And, oops, uh, I, there's a, I want to make a comment here before we, before we go into that. Um, oops, there is a custom, um, possibly it's British, I'm not sure. There's a custom in translation that I'm happy we have grown out of, and I'm also grateful that Master Hua gave us permission to not follow that custom, which is when you are translating the words of a sage, somehow it's important to make them stilted and stiff and foreign. Instead of translating the words of a sage into contemporary language, that custom was prevalent in the 19th and 20th century, um, particularly, uh, I know, in translating Buddhism, uh, Max Muller uh, and Jnana Panikatera, the, the, the translators of the 
Pali tradition from Sri Lanka uh, did it a lot. And thank goodness Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, revolutionized the uh, translations that came out of the Pali Text Translation Society into real language. But here is an example of what I'm uh, complaining about. I'm uh, whinging, you could say. But as, I, as the first translation of the famous verse that Asaji spoke that woke up Shariputra, the first encounter that I had with that is in the old style. And I want to show you why I am grateful that uh, there has been a revolution in the translation of the Buddha's words and sages as well, but particularly the Buddha. Because here's how it was done in the past. Ah, keep, there we go. Ready? It was translated as, of all those things that from a cause arise, Tathagata, the cause thereof, has told. And how they cease to be, that too he tells. This is the doctrine of the great recluse. Um, maybe this is like Wordsworth or a, uh, it's a 19th century, the romantic uh, influence of British poetry, perhaps. So, of all these things that from a cause arise, or it's just plain Yoda speak. This is Yoda, right? E.T. So, uh, what do we say now? We say, all things arise from conditions. Semicolon. Things return to emptiness when those conditions disperse. The Buddha, the great Shramana, always teaches this truth. Okay, that's real language. Zhu fa chong yuan qi, yuan jin fa yi mie, ru lai da shaman, chang zuo lu shi shuo. So this is what Asvajit spoke to Shariputra when asked what his teacher said. And on the spot, Shariputra attained stream entry. He told Madhvayayana, who entered stream entry, they went to the Buddha with 500 disciples and became his disciples. So, just a complaint about, I suppose maybe it's elegant, of all those things that from a cause arise, to talk to the cause thereof, as told. But, boy, passive voice, uh, giving it, did the Buddha really talk like that? Maybe so, maybe I'm out of step and this is how the Buddha speaks. And how they cease to be, that too, he tells. This is the doctrine of the great recluse. Perhaps, uh, I'm just too American. I'm too Australian. I want things straightforward. So, all things arise from conditions. Things return to emptiness when those conditions disperse. The Buddha, the great Shramana, always teaches this truth. Paul Karras, uh, who Professor Martin Verhoeven wrote his dissertation on, says, the stanza breaks away from the idea of divine intervention prevalent in Brahmanism at the time and says that the origin and end of all things depends upon how it began. So, this is a non-theistic doctrine, which in India at the time, oh boy, that's considered heresy. And it's the reason why so many Brahmins left Brahmanism and came to Buddhism, because it's a step deeper. You don't have to depend upon the big man in the middle to understand reality. That is liberating. That is deeply freeing. So, but you can see how damaging that is to theistic traditions where all truth arises from the man in the middle. There you have to relate to him. Your relationship with him is more important than understanding the actual source of reality, which is emptiness, and then action in the middle of that emptiness, karma, cause and effect. So powerful, powerful teaching. So if we got that about this, my discourse on the life of Shariputra, we got a lot. Chu fa, chu fa, yuan qi, yuan jin fa yi mie, 
如来大沙嘛，上座就是说。I looked into this verse, and I think there's probably 15 different versions、um, of the same teaching,、um, ex- expressed in different sutras. So, this is the teaching on emptiness, and it's why Buddhism is called in Chinese Kong Man, the gateway. To emptiness, or also could be called the school of the teaching of emptiness. Man can also mean like a, a school, a door where you go in to learn that thing. The gateway to emptiness. Okay, back to our text. We go. Shariputra said, "I'm going to go south." Okay, are we ready? I'll give you a line. You give it back. Here we go. Shi, Shi, Zun Zhe Shi Li Fu, Yu Liu Qian Bi Bi Qiu. Why is that? There should be a third tone, not a fourth tone. Bi Qiu, not Bi Qiu, ma. 比丘，第三声嘛。比丘啊、嗯，前后围绕。前后围绕。出自住处。出自住处。来意佛所。来意佛所。顶礼佛祖。顶礼佛祖。OK， 是，金富是比丘还是比丘？比丘。OK。好 ，Ready。All right, here we go. And then, Venerable Shariputra, together with six thousand bhikshus surrounding him, came out of their own abode to the Buddha's side. They bowed to the Buddha, and ready, here we go. Sai lai, Chu Bai Shi Zun. Everybody, Chu Bai Shi Zun. Shi Zun Ting Shu. 世尊听许，又绕三匝，又绕三匝，辞退而去，辞退而去，望闻数师利所，望闻数师利所。They together requested permission from the world honored one. The world honored one gave his consent, and Shariputra. Circled to the right three times, bade farewell, and left for Manjushri's dwelling. Okay, take a look here. So Shariputra, our great Arhat, the one of great wisdom, Da Zhi Shi Li Fu, together with six thousand monks surrounding him, came out of their own place. Doesn't say where it was, to where the Buddha was in the Jade Grove. They bowed to the Buddha. They, it's interesting. It says Tingshu. They requested permission, which is to say what? That's to say, in front of the Buddha,、uh, there, there's a, a right way to do things. And imagine six thousand, six thousand pictures, six thousand robes, six thousand pairs of sandals, six thousand alms bowls. Right? It's a lot. It's a lot. When they come into where the Buddha is, they all. Respectfully, probably from the ground, not not Mahayana bowing. This is, it's hot weather, so they're on the ground. They bow to the Buddha, and then look. They all look at their teacher. For sure, they do. Their teacher gives the cue. It's time to request the Buddha's permission. We're going to go follow Manjushri, a Kuyi Shifu. And the Buddha probably nods his head silently. Or maybe he goes, "Kui," or "What are you waiting for?" Of course, you may go. He gives permission. It's just a courtesy. It's the idea that they, in what do they say, "Dong bu dong," right? "Xin zhu zuo wo." No matter what they do, they want to get the Buddha's advice. They depend on the Buddha. Buddha says, "You may go." Gave his consent. Shariputra 
walked around the Buddha three times, bade farewell, and left for Manjushri's dwelling. 6,000 monks, it takes a while. <laughs> they all walk around because why? They're not going to miss this chance. This is their chance to, to bow to the Buddha and to be in his presence, to get his attention. Oh my goodness, having the Buddha to talk to, pretty special. So, the Buddha says, yes, you may go. Shariputra walked to the right three times, bade farewell, and left for Manjushri's dwelling. Now, uh, they're going to follow him. They know there's important dharma taking place. Now, I want to point out here, I think this is really interesting. The, um, the action has begun for chapter 39, entering the Dharma realm. So far, um, it's all been focused at the Jada Grove. And the Jada Grove is a multi-storied hall. It's a very adorned, beautiful place that Shariputra was essential in designing and building. Um, but it's been limited to that. And an actor in the story has appeared, Manjushri Bodhisattva. He's appeared, he shows up, he pays his respects to the Buddha, and with his group of followers, sets off to meet with his appointment to teach uh, Sudha and get this chapter underway. He kicks it off. And then we discover that there's another group of people who are going to take part in the story. And that's Shariputra and 6,000 monks. Why 6,000, people ask. And one of the stories says, they represent all six senses purified. They are big shoes. And what are big shoes? Ah, you might ask, what are big shoes? So, we hear that word here in the sutra. Whoop, here we go. Put that away. Oh, you're looking, by the way, right there on the screen on my desktop. You're looking at a number of bhikshus. Here is a senior bhikshu, bhikshu empty cloud, shu yun lao ho shang. Sitting here, this monk to empty clouds right is Master Hai Deng, ocean lamp, who was the head of Shaolin Monastery and rebuilt Shaolin Monastery. But notice in the picture we have little boys as well who jumped in, they were able to, somebody said, sit, sit, sit. Right? Here are bhikshunis on the right. Here are some more children in the back. Here are some lay women here. Here are bhikshunis here. So this was, I don't have the date of this photo, but this was uh, empty cloud. Notice he's got his beads in his hand. He's reciting. He's sitting on a Chan bench with his Arhat shoes neatly tucked beside it. Um, there are lots of young people here in this photo. So, but there are bhikshus here. What is a bhikshu? And it has nothing to do with the size of his shoes. I want people to be clear about that. Nothing to do with big shoes. Please be clear. So, what is a bhikshu? Well, there are different lists. So in the past, they said there were five. There were five. Traditionally, in, in the Tentai teachings, there are three. But in the past, they said, bhikshu means someone who scares the demons. Okay, frightener of demons, bu right? So what happens? When there are ordinations, and we just did one. We just did one. The City of 10,000 Buddhas back in July. There is a moment when, oh, the bhikshus and bhikshunis who have been preparing for, in case, some cases, five years, often three years, when they're on the platform, three by three by three, in front of the monks, and the monks say to them, Ni shi da jiang fu fao. Or, Ni shi da bi chu ni fao. Are you a great hero? Are you a maha purusha? A great man? Are you a great bhikshuni? They say, Shi da jiang fu. Or, Shi da bi chu ni. 
Yes, I am a great hero. At that point, this is part of the ceremony, they say that the palaces of the demons in the heavens, where the demons that shake, they're frightened because that is the moment when that living being, now in the body of a brand new Vikshu of Vikshuni, leaves the realm of the demons and enters the community of the Buddha. And the demon's army is reduced by one, and the Buddha's followers is increased by one. So that's what it means, frightener of demons. Number two, qi shi. That means someone who depends upon others' generosity for their livelihood. They become alms monks or alms nuns. They, everything that they eat, everything that they use and receive comes from generosity of others. Okay, the third one is not a name that the Tentai adopted. There's different ways of listing what is a bhikshu. Usually there are three in the Tentai school. Here in, this is from the Avatamsaka commentary, pure precepts is one of the names of bhikshu, an older name. Qian Ru, Sang Shu, Ying Shi, Jing Jie. As you gradually join the Sangha order, you hold the precepts more purely. Number four is called pure livelihood, not life, pure livelihood. That is to say, you no longer live um, as a soldier, you no longer live as a merchant, you no longer live um, providing food for others, you no longer live earning a living, a salary. At this point, your livelihood has been free of greed and no, uh, what are called xieming. You don't serve alcohol, you don't make weapons, you don't kill animals or birds or fish for a living, etc. That's what it means, pure livelihood. Okay, number five, this is one of the standard three, which is po, you break apart evil, you destroy evil, which is to say what? That's to say that as you cultivate the way, you really do put an end to affliction. That is to say, in your body and mind, in your spirit, you get rid of greed, you get rid of anger, you get rid of delusion. There's actual transformation. Afflictions are real things. Klesha, kilesa, right? Those are real. Some people are just full of pride. Pride, arrogance is an affliction. It's a knot in your Buddha nature, like tying a knot. And when you uh, cultivate the way, the fire of samadhi, sanme, janho, actually transforms those afflictions and it becomes bodhi. Can you imagine Shariputra? All it took was hearing a verse from the Buddha and his afflictions were so light that he, his nature and the Tao merged. How free from affliction was Shariputra. So the three basics that the, the Tentai school talks about is Bu Mo Qi Shi Po e, one who frightens demons, one who receives alms for a living, one who destroys evil. Now, the uh, commentary didn't go here, but I want to share, there's another story that says, when you have these three meanings, they are the, the cause of the three meanings of arhat. So, the, let's see here, so, three meanings of bhikshu. You can follow those through, and one who frightens demons becomes worthy of offerings. One who is a mendicant monk gets to slay thieves. One who destroys evil realizes the wusham faran, unproduced dharma patience. So, three meanings of arhat. Arhat is worthy of offerings, kills thieves, realizes the unproduced. The three meanings of bhikshu are the cause of the result of our okay so that's a little bit of extra 
dharma terminology for everybody. All righty. So, interesting, huh? 6,000 bhikshus show up, go bow to the Buddha, look for their teacher, see their teacher starting to circle the Buddha. They circle the Buddha, they follow Manjushri heading south. So, we're going to we're going to we're going to spend the next couple weeks with these bhikshus as they learn from Manjushri. Um, one of the things that happens next is uh, the sutra describes Manjushri's walking down to the realm of humans and there are spontaneously incredible things that uh, happen wherever Manjushri goes. We find out that Manjushri is uh, extraordinary. <laughs> He's an extraordinary being. And we've just heard about uh, Shariputra today, but wow, watch what we learn about Manjushri coming up. Her eyes. Watch. There we go. Oops. W A T C H. I wanted to share. Let's see here. There we go. Oh, I found it. Share a new uh, Guanyin song that you all haven't heard yet. And what's interesting about this song is I base this on my mother's favorite Christian hymn. Hmm. Um, my mother was a good Christian churchwoman to the end of her life, and um, she, let's see here if I can get rid of those. Uh, let's see here, review changes, try to change option, accept changes in the selection. Yes, good, okay, here we go. Um, she, she liked this song the best, and so I thought, what a fine setting for Guanyin Bodhisattva's uh, compassion. So. Should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for some other home? When Guan Yin is my refuge, my constant friend is she. Her ears hear all living beings, and I know she's hearing me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. She hears the cries of the world, and I know she's hearing me. Let not your heart be troubled, her tender words I hear, and resting on her goodness, I lose my doubts and fears. Though by the path she leads me, but one step I may see, she hears the cry of the world and I know she's hearing me whenever I am tempted whenever clouds arise when songs give way to sighing when hope 
within me dies I draw the closer to her from care she sets me free she hears the cries of the world and I know she's hearing me I sing because I'm happy I sing because I'm free she hears the cries of the world and I know She's hearing me. She hears the cries of the world, and I know she's hearing. Extremely popular Christian hymn. We'll see whether it becomes a Buddhist song. By and by. Meanwhile, let's do something that people know can sing along with, which is um, what I sang to my cockatoos today, my neighbors who happen to be feathered cockatoos, because why we have a new cockatoo who's adopted my deck and doesn't leave and she can't see very well. The other birds beat up on her. Her feathers are kind of droopy and she could definitely use a bath. Her feathers are dirty, not clean. And I think it's because she's, uh, when she flies, she bangs into the railing. She flies directly into the railing instead of, and bang, oh. Hits the deck, but she picks herself up and uh, keeps going. And she eats very slowly. So after all the other cockatoos have left, she's still there, you know, one bird seed at a time. So I busy, busily uh, recite the seven Tathagata's names. So uh, here we go. Hearing uh, some of these lovely names, these are designed to help out in the future. So if your animal is hearing them in an animal's body, they might leave that animal's body behind and get a healthy, long-lived human body that can cultivate. If you hear these names and you are taking exams, particularly Namoganlu Wang Rulai, uh, this will bring wisdom you will more often than not answer the right with the right answer and succeed in your exams. If you are interested in a beautiful appearance, now who would care about that? Uh, never mind the endless shelves in the pharmacists of beauty products, the <laughs> billion dollar industry in beauty products. So save your money. Instead, recite the name Miao Si Shen Lai and your body becomes spontaneously harmonious and Venusian, uh, very beautiful. Um, you're opening a business and you want to succeed. You want to make a little bit of money in your business. Namo Dobao Rulai and many treasures, Buddha. This is a perfect opportunity to um, succeed in your business. The Buddha's name is based on deep virtue and lifetimes of cultivation. And that energy is packed into the name of the Buddha. So, Li Bu Wei Rulai, apart from fear, beyond fear, fearless Buddha. Rulai is Tathagata, fearless Tathagata. This is a name you can recite when traveling and whenever there's any situation of anxiety or potential harm or danger, you recite the name of Li Bu Wei Rulai. You get 
through the, uh, that danger and come out the other side smelling like a rose, as they say. So, let's go ahead. Here we go. Ready? That's Amitabha, Mito Ruda. Here we go. Namo do Namulai, Namo Baushan Rulai, Namo Nelson Shan Rulai, Namo Bongo Shan Rulai, Namo Nidu Rulai, Namo Gandu Am Rulai, Namo Amito Rulai. Now, like I do for my cockatoos, three times makes it. Proper Dharma, here we go. Namo Dumba Rulai, Namo Namo Rulai, Namo Rulai, Namo Namo And there we go. Seventh Paganas names, oh boy. I recite those when I walk. Because there's a nice dum da da dee da dum dum da da dee da da dum. It's a nice walking rhythm which uh, carries you down the road. I wanted folks to take a look at a calendar. Um, CTDB, CTTB, DRBA, Dharma Summer Events. 2024. Take a look. Um, if in case anybody has the opportunity to come to Northern California in uh, June 15th, Venerable Masters Nirvana Day, that every year is the largest holiday on the calendar in terms of attendees. People get in buses from Los Angeles and San Diego and San Jose and Seattle and Santa Rosa come up to CPDB. Buddha Root Farm, two week retreat in the Oregon mountains. Oh, how wonderful is that? Limited space. So if anybody is interested in cultivating the way in this pristine mountains near the Oregon coast, uh, put that on your calendar, June 16th. Work week is for a small group who wants to prepare the place. There's always a group that just wouldn't miss work week. But most folks come for a week, 22 to 29 June, Buddha Root Farm. Uh, Dharma Master Lai has uh, events I shoot. He sent the new dates and I didn't get them. Um, anyway, I believe it's July 4th. Buddha recitation at Snow Mountain in the Cascade Mountains of uh, Western Washington. Beautiful place. Make a, make a reservation and don't miss that one. Then, lay Bodhisattva precepts, the six major and 28 minor, transmitted at CTDB from seven to 15. Um, Midweek, precepts for the deceased, July 11th. And for those who are there taking the, the, the lay Bodhisattva precepts, there will be an opportunity for the 42 hands and eyes. Sushir, I'll show you. So, there you are. That's just a heads up on events taking place in Northern California and in Oregon. And if I'm not mistaken, let me see. If I unshare my screen, sure enough, Chin Wei Shir is there now. Uh, Chin Wei Shir, are you there? Yes, I am here. Can you? Redwood Vihara, with Jin oh. who just arrived. Nice. Berkeley Monastery. Yeah, there must be. If you can go to the website. In fact, we everything is updated. Hey. Included the Snow Mountain Air Store session. Oh, nice. And your, dark, your dates are correct from uh, July 4th to July 7th. But we can go over there. We have uh, everything on the website. Oh, let me share. I need to share my screen here. There you go. Yep. 
So starting with uh, Guan Yin Retreat, what is uh, partly housed by DRBU extension. And this will be, of course, like we have three times a year Guan Yin session, seven days. But for those who are uh, want to be more oriented and connected to the RBU community is also opportunity. And Doug Powers will also offer some Q and A's and lectures in the evening. And as a whole group, people can join the Guan in session. Okay. And the next one is Sudana Center Retreat, June first to eighth. Uh, we do in the Sudana Center facilities. Wonderful Buddha Hall. And definitely highly recommend for you to join. More information will be sent out, although people can join if register if they wish right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, register here, yeah. Right, exactly. Okay. Oh, and want to mention there, Master, I know you saw, just yesterday was launched a new DLBU website. People uh -huh. work on that for a few months, so this is the link over there, so people can Nice. DRB. Check this out. Yeah, a new DRB website is online as of yesterday, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and Buddha oh, Farm. Here mentioned. it is. Take a look. Reed Sport, Oregon. Oh, boy. Yeah, we can notice uh, last year was <laughs> quite uh, uh, an effort to make this shot. It's actually recorded with the chanting as we walk through the Buddha Hall to the half can. And you see the group is uh, crossing the bridge as we can one in name so this is a picture and in the river yeah the and, that was in the river at the time when this picture was taken yes and the dates are you you dharma you said so it's 20, june 22nd to june 29 okay and people also can go to the uh, Buddha Farm website. Mm -hmm. And we we talked today to organizers and they should, it's not updated yet, see yet, but they should be today. Those people are in Taiwan right now, but they will update uh -huh. the website and people can also register. Okay, yeah, there are videos and, and photographs from years past. Right. Okay. Okay. And this is the Snow Mount and Monastery Retreat, uh, Air Star session. It will be three days, recitation of uh, Siti Garba Bodhisattva's name, as well with the chanting of the Sutra, Air Star Sutra. Three days on the mountains, really a rare opportunity. Uh, so those who actually join uh, the Woodward Farm is not that far to, to, to continue driving up north and, and potentially join the sessions in the mountain. That's right. Yeah, Woodward Farm is halfway there to, uh, to Seattle. And very scenic road and very highly recommended uh, mountain tour. Indeed. And you there must mention about late bodhisattva precepts. Uh, here it is, July 7 to 15. And as we s explain here, it will be a uh, certain uh, classes explained, you know, the spirit and the letter of the precepts. And people also who come will stay at the city of 10,000 Buddhas. I have an opportunity to leave and kind of monastic schedule and, and so forth. So it's like a retreat, very meaningful and will be finished with this main event, what is transmission of Bodhisattva precepts okay. at July 15. Yep, well done. And yet this is it for this upcoming uh, events the next year. Okay. And Dharmasa, you mentioned that time, maybe it's good to repeat, the time of the uh, yeah. biography of Master Empty Cloud, Shu Yun, is changed, right? Friday, 6.30 California time. It's 12.30 here in Australia, 10.30 in Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia. So, 
Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So this is it. And maybe the last thing we can mention that uh, December 23rd, we'll have a special event at Berkeley Buddhist Monastery in person. Uh -huh. And it will celebrate uh, Buddhist cross Christian, <laughs> uh, what to <you> say, <laughs> Merry Christmas. Christmas Eve. Eve. Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Eve. Eve, Eve. Eve of Christmas Eve. Eve. So December 23rd at 9 a.m. we'll start, we'll recite, we have some interactions, we have lunch, and also be opportunity to, to meet with the Dharma Master, with Reverend Shur, who uh, contact us, with us from Australia. If okay. we can add one more thing is uh, if you look at the website, we still have the Four Fearless Hearts pod oh, yeah. online still. So if you would like to sign up, now is the last moment. We had the orientation this morning, but if you would like to sign up, you can still do so, but we'll be closing it basically at the uh, end of today. And it's a very uh, rare opportunity to join very diverse and broad community. 20, people from 24 countries sign up to join wow. them. How many, how many all together? How many people? Or uh, more than 200, 200, oh. 200 uh, over 200. And we have a very kind of uh, uplifting call today. And it's this really rare, beautiful opportunity to go you know, dive into this four quality of the heart and do this with the very wholesome friends. And it's a lot of volunteers support the whole uh, journey. So it's a uh, very transformative, uh, good investment before the Christmas, I can say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's great. And, this is the, uh, what, the third or the fourth time you've done it? We do, uh, this is number fourth, right? I think, big number fourth, fourth yeah. time. And many actually people return and do again. It, we have a few who, I think, done four of them. <laughs> so, so definitely really recommend it. So those who are, uh, kind of considering it might be a join or not, this is the last moment to, to make a decision. All righty. Okay, that's great. Glad to hear it. Um, thank you for the announcements. Uh, Sam, thank you. anything to announce? For... So here we go. G C D R. Coming up at Gold Coast Dharma Realm, uh, as soon as the website pops up. We have an event to announce. And <laughs> the website is stalled. Oops. Sorry? GCDR Chinese. Oops, here we go, chmine.com, here we go. Ah, that's quick. Here we are, Gold Coast Dharma Realm. Ah, got it, okay. Down, down, wow, that's fancy, huh? Okay, Yin Yuan, Chu Shi, there we go. That, that one, Saturday events, let's see here. Amitabha Retreat, right here, look at that. Saturday, the 16th of December. To the 22nd of December, we will have an Amitabha recitation retreat right here in this very Buddha Hall. And folks are welcome to join in. If you want to get your cell phone out and snap that QR code or um, look for, let's see here. Okay, Zoom ID, here it is right here. Okay, we'll leave that up for Five, four, three, two. All righty. Well done, everyone. Uh, we learned a lot about Shariputra today. We've got uh, dedication of merit and bowing to our teacher, and we'll be done for this week. Tune in next week to find out um, what happened to those 6,000 monks when they met on Jushri Bodhisattva. <laughs>
darkness luminous and bright if people hear and see how hands and hearts can find giving unity may our minds awake to great compassion wisdom and to joy Spine reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. He calls our hearts are one. This world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassion and love. May all become compassion and love. May all become compassion. could use a little bit of compassion and wisdom in the world today, or a lot of it. Bow to the Buddhas, here we go. to the Venerable Master. That's going to do it for us for today. We'll see you all next week. Amitofu, everybody. Bye-bye now.